What up? This is Rama Screen, and in the anticipation of The Starling, which arrives September 24 on Netflix, I'm here talking with the screenwriter of this wonderful new drama film, Matt Harris. How are you, Matt? I'm great. How are you, Rama? Good, good, good. As I understand it, you started writing the script back when you were working at a mental hospital while attending graduate school at the same time. Is that correct? Well, I... I actually know I wrote it after that time, but uh, I did work at a psychiatric hospital while I was going to graduate school. So a lot of the ideas certainly came to life there. That's for sure. That's actually, you know, along my question, um, is this story somewhat loosely inspired by somebody or a patient that you encountered at that hospital or, or anybody after that? The overall story, no, but I would say certainly there are... Um, you know, there's a little bit of those characters in here. Yes, for sure. You know, and certainly just even like understanding how a, a psychiatric hospital works and what's expected of patients on a daily basis from things like multi-group, you know, multifamily therapy to how the daily questioning by psychiatrists works, you know, and where the real therapy comes in. Those are, were based on real experience for sure. You know, I remember there were the doctors who would just come in and say, how are you eating? How are you sleeping? How are you feeling? Okay, that was it. Check and we're on to the next one. And then it was just the same thing over and over again. But uh, yeah, so I would say I borrowed from a lot of little snippets here and there. Your script made it to the, uh, into the 2005 blacklist, but not until Theodore Melfi did it finally get realized on the screen. So within the past you know, 13, 14 years or so, what were the complications or the difficulties of trying to turn this script into a movie when it was making its rounds after that blacklist inclusion? Yeah, that's a great question, you know, especially since like, I remember it was on like page one or two of the blacklist and, and I was looking at it and I was looking at it at one point and I realized that every single other film had been made at that point. I was like, wait, what's going on? Uh, I wish I could tell you exactly what it was that kept it from being made for, for as long as it was. But truly, you know, I think it's a, it takes a lot for a film to be, you know, to become a real thing. It does. And look, it certainly got close on a number of occasions. You know, the closest I remember was we had the funding, we had the director, we had the actors, and they were scouting locations. And then all of a sudden, I think like a million dollars or something got pulled out of the funding, right? They cut the budget by a million. And then just like a Jenga, it was just like somebody pulled the wrong one, man, it just all crumpled, you know? I, I was so convinced, you know, because it was going to be shooting in upstate New York. I'd already booked a flight. It was crazy. We were that close. Um, but this is what happens, you know, and I mean, I'm certainly not the first one to experience that. And so I would say it just got close a number of times. In fact, Melfi and I were going to do it like five years ago. And um, he, but he had this other offer that became Hidden Figures, right? So he went and made Hidden Figures. So it was just, I thought then, okay, now we're looking for a new director and um had been talking to somebody but then Ted came back you know and so I was happy to be able to work with him I have a, a great deal of admiration for him and his work and uh, so I was really excited and then you know I think it speaks highly of Ted when you take a look at the cast list here you know Melissa McCarthy Kevin Klein, and and so forth I think it really speaks well of him because <clears throat> you know the cast especially on something like this, right? Where they're not being paid Marvel money to come on and be on the movie, right? You know, so it's not like, uh, yeah, they're doing it for a paycheck. They're, they're doing it for the material and they're doing it to work with this director who they feel like will get the best out of them. So it, it's really a compliment to Ted when you look at that cast list. But when you were writing the script, did you have uh, Melissa McCarthy in mind or any other actress in mind for uh, Kevin Klein and for those roles? Uh, and how did you like some of the changes that Ted did to your script? Yeah, you know, I think I tried to, in a weird way, I don't try to write to, <clears throat> excuse me, picturing an actual star. Mm. I don't. Um, it, it, I think it helps me, it keeps me from writing. Let's just say I was writing for Paul Giamatti, right? Now, all of a sudden, if I'm thinking of Paul Giamatti, 
I might start thinking of Paul Giamatti in Sideways. Now I'm writing, writing not for Paul Giamatti, but I'm writing for the character that he played in Sideways. And I'm just imitating a character that's already been done. You know what I mean? Because I've you. done that before. And it's a real slippery slope. And it just always seems to not read great. So I try to keep it loose. But yes, certainly, you know, when you try to imagine people who could be in it, you know, um, yeah, it, it would be wonderful, you know. Uh, but I never dreamed, actually, that Melissa McCarthy would be available and be willing to do it. She's, you know, she's a very in-demand actor. and. Uh, um, she carries a whole lot of clout. She really does. You know, her films have grossed over a billion dollars. So there's a lot of people that want to work with her and pay her, you know. <laughs> but then uh, you asked me, I'm sorry, about the changes as well, you said. Yeah, because when, uh, usually when a director comes in, you know, there's like 50, 60% chances that uh, they're going to, I mean, the director would try to tweak here and there about the script to fit the vision that they have in their mind. Uh, so how'd you like what, what Seth did? Yeah, I, I did. I liked it. You know, I thought he brought um, in the tweaks. The good news is, is that Ted shot the script that I wrote, which I was really happy about, you know. Mm. Um, and you are a little nervous about what a director, especially a director who's a writer as well, right, yes. um, will do with the project. So um, I was glad that, you know, we didn't write new scenes or, you know, change characters. And I didn't like show up on set and like, who's that? And they're like, that's Mabel. She's a new character. I was like relieved that that kind of shock never happened. You know, um, he's a good communicator. And uh, we did work on the script back and forth. Uh, we had about a month to work on it before they actually started shooting. So we got it into a pretty good place to where I think some of the actors, you know, are really strong at, um, at improv, you know? And so I think you saw that come together a bit, you know? If you remember, there's a scene where Melissa's with the uh, the exterminator guy, the guy who's got the pesticide store. <laughs> they started in on this ad lib improv, those two of them. Wow. And it just somewhere, you know, when they started going back and forth about how many billion, you know, and it just made me laugh so hard. I was really afraid that I was going to blow the scene by laughing so hard, you know. But that was them. That was the two yeah. of them, really, you know. So it's fun. It's fun to see that magic happen. When dealing with a sensitive topic like uh, parents losing a child, it must yeah. be tough to try to insert humor appropriately somewhere in the in, in that storyline. Uh, but you managed to do that with the Starling. There are humorous instances in this film, and it's done tastefully in reverence, uh, nothing over the top. Uh, so it's more of a dramedy, you know, than straight up drama. How did you manage to strike that balance? How did you accomplish that balance between comedy and drama in the Starling? Well, I appreciate it, number one, you know, because it is kind of a fine line and it is a dance that you're doing, mm -hmm. writing a screenplay like this. I've always tried to say that, like, I feel like um, heavy emotion is best delivered in small but powerful doses, right? And I think one way to deliver it is, you know, um, you, you sweeten it a little bit first. And, you know, you do that with a little bit of comedy. And I think it, it can really have a much more powerful impact rather than just starting off with that sort of, you know, dark and depressing and going to another dark, depressing level. And it's like, when am I going to see some sunshine here, you know? Uh, I, but I feel like the lighter moments also feel real to me. I try to, I try to keep them real. You know, we had a very good discussion about that before they started shooting and you know, I just expressed some of my concerns and my, some of my concerns were, you know, I, I wanted the film to feel uh, true and honest. I didn't want the comedy to come out as over the top and uh, mm -hmm. cliched. And I, I didn't want it to feel like melodrama when it did get sad and touching, you know, they were going to be talking about some very real stuff. And I just felt like it had to be handled carefully. And the balance that you were talking about, you know, Mm -hmm. that dance it's it's a tough one it's a tough one um there were some other things that were in the, the script that were shot too that just for time couldn't be made and you know the first cut of this film was two two hours and 42 minutes so they wow. had to take a full hour out um so unfortunately we lost some some threads that weave their way through that you know maybe we're even a little bit more comedy i'll have that argument someday <laughs> i don't know what if i ever watch the director's cut you know 
but uh, yeah, we stayed with the main story. Um, that's for sure. As I'm winding down, I got to ask you this. I'm yeah. so curious uh, because when I first saw the starling bird, you know, getting chased by the, the, the crow yeah. uh, at the beginning, I, I thought it was going to be like uh, the feather uh, floating in Forrest Gump, you know, where you only see it in the beginning and then <laughs> you see it again at the end. You know, I didn't, I didn't expect the bird to be an integral part of the story. And uh, so I don't know much about birds, but uh, is our actual starlings as pesky and confrontational as yeah. the ones depicted in this film? And uh, what does the starling symbolize or represent in relation to Lily and Jack's grief? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad. And that's really funny. You know, I never thought about that, but that could have actually been just like that feather, right? I forgot about that. <laughs> that's funny. Um, you know, for me, I wanted to open with a chase scene, by the way. That was why I wrote that. I was like, we got to start this thing off with some action. Let's start a chase scene. Um, the, uh, the representation of the starting, starting are pretty fascinating birds. They really are. You know, and I'm not, uh, what do they call them? Ornithologists. Is that what a bird, I think, is bird enthusiast, mm -hmm. you know, but I've learned a lot about them. And, mm -hmm. and uh, starlings are really fascinating in that, you know, they are very territorial, very invasive. They're not natural to North America. They were introduced by this ridiculous, this crazy industrialist in Manhattan during the, I think it was the late 1890s. He's like, <laughs> he had too much money on his hands is what he did. And he's like, Shakespeare writes about starlings, but we need to, we don't have any starlings here. So he brought them to New York and he released them. And suddenly <laughs> it took over every roosting pigeons, you know, spot. They were, they couldn't get rid of, they were trying to get rid of them. They were just, they just overran the city. And then they just started heading West. And mm -hmm. I remember reading a statistic about them saying that they, they migrated and conquered territory faster than any other migratory creature has ever done when they swept across the American West all the way to California. And then of course they're everywhere now, uh, but that's because they're, they're survivors, you know? And that's kind of what drew them to me. And I think in terms of symbology, I, I like that they're survivors and, uh, and fighters and nurturers at the same time. And uh, so they, they took on many sort of metaphorical ideas for me. And, mm -hmm. um, but they're highly intelligent and wonderful, almost magical creatures. You know, when you see them in those clouds and they swoop and, you know, that it was true what uh, happened with Mozart, you know, he, he had a starling and it did recite one of his concertos and he was truly inconsolable when it died, you know? So it's like, who are these creatures, right? These aren't raccoons, right? These aren't, you know, any of these other sort of scoundrel creatures that we have, you know. Um, I love crows too, they're brilliant, but uh, starlings are unique. Starlings are unique in the way that they, they, they stay together and, uh, and like I said, they're survivors. So what do you hope actual grieving couples out there can take away from watching the starling? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's wrong to, to ever say to anybody like, you know what, Rama, you're going to get over this, you know, because mm. you're never, I don't think we get over things. I think we hope to get around, get through. We try to get to the other side of something, but, you know, serious loss, serious tragedy. It never really leaves us, right? As long as we remember it, it's part of us and it, you know, it has a feeling associated with it. And, you know, like the, the character of the doctor tells Jack, you know, in this film, you know, hopefully someday you'll be able to, you're going to say her name and, and, it, and it's going to be okay. It'll just come out and pass, and, you know, and that's what you're looking for. And I would say to anybody watching this who's experienced some tragedy that I, um, I hope you find some hope in this. You know, I think we could all use some of that. I think it's been, these last two years have been, a lot of crap, <laughs> you know, it's been tough. I think it's been tough on everybody. I think it's been tough on our, our psyches as well. You know, uh, we've, we've all lost, we've all lost, you know, the semblance of the life we thought we knew that was a normal life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we've all experienced some loss and I think we're trying to get to the other side of it. We're trying to figure out what that is. And that's simply what these two main characters are trying to do, I think, is how do we get back to us? 
you know, and where do we, where do we do that? And uh, yeah, it's just a, the shred of hope is all I'm going for. Just, just a little bit of hope, you know, that's all we need. It's a seed, it'll grow, you know. I got you. I got you. That's very beautiful. And thank you for sharing that. And uh, so for my fans at home, everybody go check out The Starling arriving September 24, only on Netflix. Matt, thank you for talking to me and congratulations, sir. Thank you so much, Ram. I really appreciate it.